Hello everybody, today we're going to be talking about the tragic story of Tokyo Rose and how someone who was loyal to the United States became one of its few citizens to ever be convicted of treason. In research for a World War II project I'm working on, I came across this story as it related to World War II propaganda. It was common during World War II and even some conflicts that came afterwards for militaries to have dedicated radio operators who would speak to the enemy in their own language. The purpose of these broadcasts was to have someone, most often a woman, speak to the enemy in their own language and try to demoralize them from continuing to fight. This was done by playing music from their homeland to make them homesick, or lie about troop movements to make them think they're losing the war, or even just talking about how their girlfriends are probably at home cheating on them. This effort was carried out by multiple operators across different factions in the war. In Europe, this ring of mystery broadcasters were given the name of Axis Sally. And in the Pacific, these voices were known as Tokyo Rose. And while the broadcasts themselves are interesting, what I want to focus on today is how Tokyo Rose became one of the most expensive trials in the United States and the only person in American history to be both convicted and pardoned of treason. And if that sounds interesting to you, then stick around after the ad as we get into the story of a secret double agent who stood for the country that would later convict them. But before we get into some more cursed knowledge, let's talk about something that isn't cursed, like saving money. And you can start saving money right now thanks to today's sponsor, Honey. Honey is the number one shopping tool in America that helps you save money when you buy something online. You can get Honey for free in just two clicks, and then when you are shopping and get to checkout, Honey will begin to scour the internet to find you discount codes so you can start saving cash. And now, thanks to Honey's mobile extension, you don't even need your at-home computer to do it because you can get it on your phone and start saving money while on the go. Honey can save you money on things that you're probably already paying for. For example, whenever I buy a PC or takeout, I make sure that Honey's installed because all I have to do to save money is literally lift a finger. Honey is free and works on a ton of the sites that you're already shopping from, so you might as well start saving money on something you didn't even know you were paying too much for. And today, you can get Honey for free by going to the link in the description at joinhoney.com forward slash windagoon. That is right, you can get Honey completely free by going to that link in the description, and I ask that you use that link because it lets them know that I sent you, and it really does help out the channel, and I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to Honey for sponsoring the video. It really does mean the most. I hope you all check them out. Link is in the description, and we are back to the video. We are gonna go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. As mentioned earlier, radio propaganda was very common in World War II. The soldiers on the ground would give names to these voices on the radio, even if it was multiple people. In other words, if you were a U.S. soldier in Europe and there were multiple women who were speaking on the radio to try to convince you to turn away from fighting, you would broadly refer to this group of women as Axis Sally. The reason you'd be listening to the enemy's radio broadcast in the first place is, for one, depending on your location, it could be the only broadcast you can pick up. And two, the broadcast would spice it up with American music and news in order to keep people listening. And then, you know, from there they'd sprinkle in the ideas of how their country's going to fall apart and their women are cheating on them. And the enemies are precisely those people who are fighting against Germany today, and in case you don't know it, indirectly against America too. Because a defeat for Germany would mean a defeat for America, believe me. Now, while most of the time you could just see this as some weird form of bullying or picking on soldiers, every now and then they would say something important. Military intelligence is very safely guarded during a war, and most often it's illegal to give away that intelligence. For example, say that you were an American living in California, and you watched a fleet of ships sail from California out towards Japan. Well, if somehow you were to catch a plane or what have you and beat America to the Japanese army and then tell them that you saw a fleet of ships leaving, that would be illegal. The same would apply if you were to call the enemy or send them a letter or for our cases today, make a radio broadcast. Now, obviously, this doesn't really matter when it just comes to the enemy. If a German citizen were to find out information regarding American movements and then told other Germans they're not an American committing a crime against America, they're just a German, you know, being a German. However, where it does matter 
is whenever it's an American citizen who does that. And in broadcasts like Axis Sally, Sally would regularly give information regarding American troop movements. If a group of soldiers was wiped out on some battlefield, Axis Sally would report it to all American soldiers across the front lines. This was done, again, in an effort to demoralize the American soldiers, but it's also a breach of military intelligence. Now, obviously, this wouldn't matter if it was a German citizen reporting it. However, where it gets interesting is that a lot of these broadcasters were American. If an American defected to the enemy, or just so happened to be in the country whenever the war started and then willingly helped the enemy, that was seen as an act of treason against the United States. Not really for being mean to the soldiers on the ground, but more so for giving up sensitive information. So therefore, whenever the war was over, American legislators began tracking down people who were responsible for these broadcasts. One of the more famous convictions during this time was Mildred Gillers, who turned out to be the aforementioned Axis Sally. But the more infamous conviction comes from the Pacific Campaign and the American government's hunt for the Japanese broadcaster known as Tokyo Rose. Ava Tagori was born in Los Angeles on, coincidentally, the 4th of July, 1916. Her family was from Japan, and she was the first generation of the family to be born in the United States. From a young age, her parents were so persistent that she adopt the American lifestyle that they forbade her from doing things like learning Japanese or eating with chopsticks. Growing up in Los Angeles, she lived a perfectly normal American lifestyle. She adopted activities like hiking and excelled at sports like tennis while she was in high school. She was also a big fan of American media and had a crush on actor Jimmy Stewart and enjoyed listening to radio shows such as Little Orphan Annie. She excelled at school and graduated from UCLA with a bachelor's degree in zoology in 1940. She had aspirations of continuing her education and becoming a doctor, that was until her aunt back in Japan became very ill. Ava's father always emphasized the importance of family and felt that it was necessary for their family to leave from California and visit their now sick relatives back in Japan. However, during this time, Ava's mother was very sick due to diabetes. Unable to make the journey or leave Ava's mother without care, Ava's father decided that Ava should travel to Japan by herself in order to represent the family and take care of her sick aunt. Ava protested at first, but given her father's insistence, decided to set sail for Japan on July the 5th, 1941, one day after her 25th birthday. The plan was for Ava to spend one year there with her relatives before returning home. However, after being there for only a short amount of time, Ava was already sick of it. For one, Ava couldn't speak Japanese, which made living in Japan difficult to begin with. But she also said that people were rude, and she was very unfamiliar with the customs of the region. In one letter to home, she wrote, I have finally gotten around to eating rice three times a day. It's killing me, but what can I do? Ava's aunt and uncle, who she was staying with, spent most of their time at home, and Ava made the errands for them. Because of this, Ava's aunt and uncle weren't privy to the events happening in the news around that time, and Ava herself, whenever she did go out, couldn't understand anyone or read any newspapers that she saw. Because of this, Ava wasn't aware that Japan was about to enter World War II against the United States. When she did find out in late November of 1941, she scheduled to take the first ship back to the country. She was set to leave on December the 2nd of 1941, however on the day she was to set sail there was a problem with her paperwork at the customs office. This delayed her enough that she would have to miss the boat and then take next week's ship back to the country. However, this ship would never set sail because only five days later, on December 7th of 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and plunged America and Japan into World War II. Ava was one of about 10,000 Japanese Americans who were trapped in Japan during the war. And as with many of those Japanese Americans, Ava was harassed by Japan's secret police. Something interesting about World War II, and something I'll talk about more in future videos, is it was the first time that intelligence and essentially spy networks were such a major role within any warfare. Like sure, there had always been spies in wars previous, but advances in technology made it to where messages could be delivered much more quickly and from over distance, and because of that, everyone was suspect. So as you can imagine, American citizens who were in Japan were under a lot of scrutiny. 
As a matter of fact, several of them were forced to leave their home and live in housing projects so that the government could keep an eye on them. When Ava was confronted by the secret police, they demanded that she renounce her U.S. citizenship. Ava refused and said that she would rather be thrown into the housing with the other foreigners. The police wouldn't do this because she was ethnically Japanese and also because she was a woman and most of the people who were thrown into these projects were men. However, shortly after this, Ava's aunt and uncle kicked her out for not renouncing her American citizenship. So, you know, trusting government agents over bloodlines. I'm sure history will look kindly on them for that. On top of that, because she wouldn't deny her U.S. citizenship, she was denied a food ration card. So now homeless, with no way to get food in a country that she didn't speak the language of, Ava needed a job. And she got that job at the Domi News Agency, where her job was to listen to American news broadcast and write down whatever was being said. It was during this time that she lost connection to her family. Unbeknownst to her at the time, her family had been moved to Japanese internment camps in Arizona. Which, for those of you that don't know, during the war, the American government set up internment camps where they took anyone on the West Coast who was Japanese and then rounded them up and placed them into these massive camp facilities. I wonder where they got that idea from. It was during this time, while completely cut off from her family back home and in Japan, that she made a friend in someone by the name of Felipe de Aquino. Felipe was in a similar situation. While ethnically Japanese, he was a Portuguese citizen who just got stuck in Japan whenever the war began. The two were both strangers in a foreign land who seemed to find friendship in each other. So much so that whenever Ava was hospitalized due to malnutrition, most likely because she was working for pennies and only ate when she could, Felipe paid her hospital bills. Ava hated owing anyone money, so despite Felipe's protest, Ava took on a second job in order to start paying him back. This job was at a place known as Radio Tokyo. Radio Tokyo had recently launched a propaganda campaign in which generals would write scripts to be spoken in English that were meant to be heard by American soldiers. Ava's job was to type out scripts that were written by Japanese government officials, and then that would be passed on to a radio operator who would speak them for American soldiers. It was during this time that Ava met a man by the name of Major Charles Cousins. Charles was an Australian major who was captured during one of the early battles of World War II. Before the war, Charles was a famous radio personality in Sydney, Australia. So, instead of being held in a Japanese prison or executed, the government decided that he could be beneficial. They made him work at Radio Tokyo, where he was to write out scripts that would be engaging for American listeners, and then they would come through and sprinkle their propaganda into those messages. Initially, Charles was there more so just to proofread the scripts before they went on to be broadcasted. However, Charles began to complain that there were so many grammatical errors in what the Japanese wanted him to write that it would make more sense if he just wrote the words himself. The government eventually relented and allowed Charles to begin writing his own scripts. However, of course, they would be read over by the Japanese before it was aired. The name of the show was Zero Hour, and it was to be a combination of news broadcast and music from the United States, as well as several messages to generally make the troops sad. However, as you could imagine, Major Charles was not a fan of the Japanese, considering he was a prisoner and all, and he decided that he was going to use Zero Hour to get a stab back at them. See, these Japanese officials weren't great at English and didn't have an understanding of things like American jokes or sarcasm. So Charles decided that he was going to use this script in order to be a help or pretty much the opposite of what the Japanese officials wanted him to do, and he was going to find himself a radio operator who could get it done. So whenever Charles met Ava, he knew he found his girl. Ava not only understood American speech patterns and jokes, but she also had a distrust and hatred for the Japanese government. So Zero Hour began, and to the Japanese, it was a major hit to American forces, while to the Americans, it was a fun radio show. It's interesting how Charles and Ava got away with doing the things that they did because it all has to do with cultural misunderstanding. Like, for example, one of the only negative things that Ava ever did in her broadcast was refer to the American Marines as boneheads. 
Now, to the Japanese officials, this was explained as being a direct insult, which was good for them. But if you ask any Marine, even today, they do not mind a pretty woman calling them a bonehead. The majority of the music that Charles selected for the program wasn't even American in order to make them homesick. Instead, it was music from Britain and Australia. And whenever they did play American music, it was music like Strike Up the Band, which was the song of Ava's alma mater, UCLA. These songs were chosen because they were inspiring or encouraged soldiers to keep fighting, not to make them sad. She would do things in the program like call the Americans her friend before catching herself and calling them enemies. Greetings, everybody. This is your number one enemy, your favorite playmate, Orphan Anne of Radio Tokyo. The little sunbeam whose throat you like to cut. We're ready again for a vicious assault on your morale. 75 minutes of music and news for our friends. I mean our enemies in the South Pacific. She would go as far as to openly warn the Americans, be careful whenever you're listening to this radio channel as there's dangerous propaganda. Ava only spoke for about 20 minutes of the hour-long radio show, and less than 10% of people who were asked said they felt any bit of demoralization from any part of the entire hour-long show because of the effect that Ava had. One soldier who was interviewed even remarked, lots of us felt that she was on our side the whole time. Japanese officials said all of the radio hosts needed to give themselves an American name while on the air, so she gave herself the name of the show she loved back at home, Little Orphan Anne. This is Orphan, this is Orphan Anne, addressing the boys in South Pacific for Radio Tokyo. Which some American soldiers correctly guessed that she was American because she knew about the show that they had also grown up with. She would also refer to the American soldiers as orphans, which again is one of those moments where the Japanese thought it was a diss and the Americans found it endearing. Because whenever she was speaking about the American soldiers, she would refer to them and herself as us orphans. She would even pretend to have broken English and start off some shows by saying things like, the show, you are the liking, please, before laughing and then speaking normally. All in all, Ava helped American spirits a lot more than she heard it. And to this day, many see her as a soldier who was fighting for the United States behind enemy lines. However, that fight became more difficult as time went on. In 1944, Major Charles became ill and had to leave his job at the radio show. I say job, it was really like, you know, a forced position, but you get the point. And during this time, the Japanese officials decided that it would be best if they took over writing for the show again. Ava stalled on this as long as she could by taking the Major's old scripts and rewording them a little bit, and then just doing them again. However, when the Japanese officials started suggesting that they write new ones altogether, she started playing hooky from the broadcast. She managed to keep this up for several months by only coming in sometimes and saying she's sick other times or couldn't make it to work. It was during this time that she married her friend Felipe in 1945. And shortly after that, America dropped the nuclear bombs on Japan and they quit caring about their radio propaganda programs. All in all, Ava had been broadcasting for over three years through 340 different episodes of Zero Hour. And as mentioned earlier, once the war was over, American officials began trying to find the supposed broadcast. And in the military's investigation, the one where they polled people who listened to Zero Hour, as well as people who listened to this Tokyo Rose in general, they came to the conclusion that Tokyo Rose didn't exist. And that's because she didn't exist. The reason I never mentioned Tokyo Rose while talking about Ava's broadcast is because that's never a name that she or anyone else used. Tokyo Rose was a name that the American troops would give to any woman on the radio who spoke to them in English. In the exact same way that Germans were called Jerry, or during the Civil War, Northerners were called Billy Yank and Southerners were called Johnny Reb. The investigation found that Tokyo Rose was just a pseudonym that was broadly given to several people. However, this answer was not suitable for journalists. Back in the U.S., there were all these stories of a Tokyo Rose, and people who were not in the war just assumed that there was an individual by the name of Tokyo Rose. Two reporters, Henry Brundage and Clark Lee, traveled to Japan in order to find this supposed Tokyo Rose. They eventually made it to Radio Tokyo and asked one of Ava's co-workers who pointed out Ava as being the one and only Tokyo Rose. When Ava was approached by these reporters, she vehemently denied this, although they wouldn't let up. 
After word got out that Ava was the supposed Tokyo Rose, there was a media frenzy. Dozens of reporters tried to talk to her, and American soldiers who were now in Japan would continuously ask for her autograph. Could you tell me where to buy uh, kimono? Kimono. Uh, May I get help you, sir? Oh, thank you. Uh, there's a department store two blocks to your left and one block to your right. I'm sure you'll be able to buy anything Japanese there. You speak very good English. Thank you, sir. You sound very vaguely familiar to me. Well, you may have picked up the voice aboard ship. Aboard ship? Oh, I know. Radio? Yes, <laughs> Tokyo Rose. Oh, thank you, uh, Miss Rose. You're welcome, Radio sir. Tokyo. While she later said she found the American soldiers endearing, she didn't like the idea of officially calling herself Tokyo Rose in any capacity. Again, as she knew, there wasn't even a Tokyo Rose to begin with. Eventually, the two reporters, Henry and Clark, offered her $2,000 to do an interview. Felipe encouraged Ava to take this deal for two reasons. For one, they didn't have a whole lot of money. Some reports say that Ava was making as little as 150 yen a month while working at Radio Tokyo, or in other words, about 7 US dollars. And two, Felipe felt that maybe doing this interview would get all the other journalists off their back. So, Ava sat down to do an interview with the two of them, and then they had her sign a piece of paper that stated that she was definitively the Tokyo Rose. Well, I suppose you GIs would like to know a little bit about me. Now, I was born in the city of Los Angeles and went to the University of California at Los Angeles, graduating in the year 1941. I left the United States in July of 1941 to visit a, a sick aunt my mother's only living sister here in Japan. Now again, Ava, who had yet to return to the U.S., did not know that this was signing her arrest warrant. See, she just figured this whole Tokyo Rose thing was a sort of celebrity fanfare, at least with the way the soldiers had been treating her. Well, we know you in the Navy uh, as Tokyo Rose. I wonder, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about you? Well, it isn't so terribly much to tell about me. Well, where do you exactly. come from? I come from Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles. Uh, how old are you? Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Uh, how long have you been in Tokyo? Uh, four years. I see. Well, I suppose you're happy that the war is over for the Japanese and the Americans as well. Yes, sir, I am. Well, that's well. Thank you very much, Tokyo Road. You're welcome. She did not know that the American State Department was trying to hunt down this supposed propaganda traitor. So, shortly after this interview, on August the 17th of 1945, Ava was arrested in Japan. She was put in Sugamo prison and kept in a 9 foot by 6 foot cell. She was treated quite brutally there. For example, she was only allowed to wash once every three days, and the area she was washing in was open to public view because they wanted people to be able to come and see the now naked Tokyo Rose. To some, Tokyo Rose was seen as a sort of sex icon, so now it was an advertisement that they could come see her in the flesh. She was not allowed to sleep at night until she finished signing autographs for people who came to visit her, and she was only allowed to see her husband Felipe for 20 minutes once every month. However, it was during this time that America was doing its aforementioned investigation into Tokyo Rose and determined that Tokyo Rose didn't exist, and if she did, Ava wasn't a problem. So on October the 25th of 1946, Ava was released from the Japanese prison. Shortly after this, in 1947, Ava became pregnant with her and Felipe's child. She decided that she wanted her child to be born in the United States, and as you could imagine, she was pretty tired of Japan. Because of this, she applied for her and Felipe to travel to the United States. Whenever the American media got wind that Tokyo Rose was trying to re-enter into the United States, they had a frenzy. One of which was Walter Winchell, a news reporter who said that it was a travesty that a traitor to the United States would be allowed back into the country unless it were in chains. The media managed to get people fired up and eventually it became a social outcry that this traitor of the country should be tried for her crimes. This, as you can imagine, didn't allow Ava to return to the United States and her son was born in January of 1948, however he died a day later. On August the 28th of 1948, Ava was arrested and brought to the United States to stand trial. 
This was in spite of the assistant attorney general who ran the original trial or investigation against Ava, who said, quote, her on-air activity consisted of nothing more than the announcing of music selections. Uh, she was uh, picked out by Major Cousins uh, when he was told to design a, a disc jockey type program. And uh, the next thing that happened to her were Radio Tokyo personnel coming down to her and telling her to go to a certain place and read a script and be auditioned. She wasn't asked if she wanted to do it. She was told to do it. And she did. The Army investigators felt they had no case to make against Iva, and she was released. She wanted nothing more than to return to her father in America. Her mother had died in an American internment camp in Arizona. Despite this, her trial began on July the 5th of 1949, one day after her 33rd birthday, in which she was charged with eight counts of treason. The trial was a media storm, as you could imagine, and the majority of the reporters who were reporting on the case said that it would probably end up with an acquittal. That was because every witness who was brought forward, which the witnesses were American soldiers, said that they loved Ava's show and that it did nothing but boost their morale. By the end of the trial, it was a hung jury. However, the judge, Michael Roche, said that they need to come up with a guilty or not guilty verdict. Michael Roche later admitted that he thought Ava was guilty before the trial even began, showing that he entered the trial with bias. The only witnesses that said anything against Ava were people who were brought from Japan in order to testify against her, and those witnesses later said that it was implied to them by government officials that if Ava isn't convicted, then they're probably going to be put on trial next. Because of all of this shuttling people from Japan to the United States, the trial cost around $750,000, making it the most expensive in U.S. history at that time. So whenever the jury was hung, the judge supposedly said a line around, we're not spending over half a million dollars just to get a hung verdict. So because of this, the pressure jury eventually decided that she was guilty on one count of treason. This makes Ava the seventh person in American history to be convicted of treason. And on October the 6th of 1949, she was sentenced to 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. Ava remarked that she didn't care about the sentencing because to herself, she knew that she wasn't a traitor. She was held at the Reformatory for Women in Alderson, West Virginia. However, she was released for good behavior on January the 28th of 1956, only serving six years and two months of her sentence, although that was six years and two months too many. Now, during this time, a ton of different people were trying to get an official pardon for Ava. As you can imagine, there were a bunch of people who supported her and felt that the government had done her wrong. They petitioned to people like President Eisenhower and at the time director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, which if you don't know how I feel about him, watch my MLK video. However, no one would grant her that pardon. Also, for two years after she was released from prison, the State Department tried to get her deported. Her lawyers fought them off, but even after sending the six years and all the people trying to get her a presidential pardon, the government was still trying to kick her out of the country. Eventually, in 1976, 60 Minutes ran a special about Ava in which she was interviewed. The Japanese used Tokyo Rose to demoralize American fighting men, and Americans, who gave her her name, used her as a symbol of everything oriental and evil. But that was another time, more than 30 years ago, when it was all right to be racist about your enemies. After the war, a woman was identified as Tokyo Rose. She was tried and sent to prison. Who was she, and whatever happened to her? And there's a move afoot to obtain a presidential pardon. She maintains that she was framed, a victim of the time. Who did you want to win the war? There was, there was no uh, question about that. I wanted the United States to win. I mean, there was no question about it. I mean, what, what, what I know about Japan? The only country I knew was the United States. I'd only been in Japan a few months. This showed that there was no Tokyo Rose and Ava was falsely imprisoned for crimes she didn't commit. And due to public outcry, because that's the only reason anything good in government ever happens, Gerald Ford, in one of his last acts as president, officially pardoned Ava, making Ava Tagori the only person in American history to be pardoned of treason. 
However, Ava continued to suffer regardless. Her husband Felipe was barred from entering the United States after the trial of Ava, and despite many petitions and protests, Felipe was not allowed into the United States, and regretfully, in order for the two to move on with their lives, they were divorced in 1980, meaning that after the trial, Ava and Felipe never saw each other again. After this, Ava lived a quiet life with her remaining family in Chicago, Illinois. She lived a quiet life, and those around her later testified that she was a very peaceful and pleasant woman who frequently enjoyed things like quilting and listening to music at the Chicago Opera. When asked about the pardon, she felt that it was a vindication from something that she was never guilty of. Which, by the way, that one count of treason that they did get her on was because in 1944 she said that some ships had sunk in the Battle of Leyte. Now, this was a very large naval battle, and it was common knowledge that, yes, ships had sunk during a naval battle. And while she was never even specific if they were Japanese or American, and both had been sunk that day, at the trial they said that she was probably referring to American, and that discretion was enough to sentence her to 10 years. Despite the ridiculousness of all this, Ava never seemed bitter later in life, and lived out the rest of her life with her family until she died of natural causes in September of 2006. When she died, the newspapers reported that the infamous Tokyo Rose had passed away, which was in itself another false accusation of treason, and the only treason that Ava ever knew was that that her country committed against her. And with that, we have the tragic story of the real Tokyo Rose. Wasn't that happy and uplifting? I know stories like this can be depressing, but one of the reasons that I like making videos like this is that I feel these stories deserve to be remembered, and people like Ava deserve to be talked about. But none of that matters because you made it this far, so hopefully you feel the same way, and I just want to say thank you for watching. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I came across this while doing research into a much larger World War II project that I've continuously hinted at in several of the past videos, and I felt like this deserved its own story. And I may do this with some more stories that I come across while I'm going through all of these radio broadcasts and newspapers and what have you. Uh, and I thought it's interesting, and hopefully you did too. So thank you so much to everyone for watching. Thank you to my subscribers, 1.27 million. I really can't believe it. You all are too good to me, and I appreciate it. Thank you for getting me to this point. Thank you for my uh, ex-patrons who managed to boost me up to get me to this point. I wouldn't be here without you guys, and it really does mean a lot. So I'm going to get back to work. Uh, I'm going to edit this and get it out. Uh, that, Like I said, there are also going to be other big videos coming out soon. Uh, thank you for letting me talk about all my weird, crazy history stuff like this in Fordlandia. It means a lot that if you're sticking around watching, you're supporting me that I can continue to do this stuff. And thank you for enabling my bad habit. I really appreciate it. Uh, but for now, I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. And I will see you in the next one. Bye!